Okay, welcome everyone. We should have uh, some very interesting discussion this afternoon. It's a hot topic. And uh, of course, we want to work better with China for, for the future of the planet, not be making enemies of each other. But we all want to build better cities, happy cities, green cities, um, and uh, communities where everybody works together. So that's the purpose of uh, AI and smart cities, to help people not take away their jobs, right? OK, so um, I'm going to be the moderator. And this is the order of the speaker. So it's me, Oliver Yu, Wenli Yu, and uh, Yang Ming Li. And you already have our, our bios, but we have a brief introduction. So my background is here, right? Um, what's relevant for this talk? I taught in China for two years at the Second Foreign Language Institute in Beijing. Uh, my Chinese is pretty fluent, right? And then I uh, <laughs> lectured at the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, and I lectured at Beida. At uh, Beida's English name is uh, I forgot. Beijing University. <laughs> what? Beijing University. Beijing University. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so when you're there, you kind of get you know immersed, and then you forget the English, right? Okay. So uh, then I was. A, Chinese computer software representative in China. Um, actually, uh, the company that I worked for was Tianma, or was International Geosystems. They invented the first pinyin Chinese input method. And I could type 120 words a minute in Chinese. Because Chinese syllables are short. And with Tianma, we don't have to use tones. Because after eight characters, it figures out what's the right character. And that's, that's how people understand things when they listen, although sometimes tones can mess us up if they get the wrong tone, right? OK, so uh, I've been working on smart city and smart grid development. I was in Beijing in 19 or 2006 uh, and seven, right? Working on the state grid and, and those smart city projects. Um, and then since 2008, I've been on the board of the US-China Green Energy Council, which um, uh, is US-China Green Energy. So it's a promoting collaboration between the two countries. And um, then I worked on with uh, Heller Manis, which is a, a city planner. And they, they plan cities. They've got about eight cities in China that they planned. And I'm actually currently working with them again on two city projects. One, one's in Chengdu, one's in Xi'an. Uh, they're trying to modernize, make it a sustainable, smart district. At the same time as they want to promote their ancient history and culture, right? So they're, they have kind of divided loyalties as they tr develop. Yet they need to go together. So it's just a question of you know, bridging the way people look at things. And that's what AI is supposed to help us do. OK, then uh, that's it for that part. OK, I've been also working with Steve Chun. He's doing, he was the inventor of the uh, uh, supercomputer called Cray. Right? And then since, uh, since he left Cray, he's been working in China developing healthcare supercomputers and community development uh, connectivity using supercomputers. So he's joined us with these two projects, and where the three of us, or three companies, are working together on that. Um, okay, the, this is the global standard, right? United Nations. Uh, so there's 17 things you need to do to make a city really sustainable and smart and friendly and all that, right? And that's a global standard. China's a member, right? Uh, Xi Jinping. Ping has gone there and they joined it. Uh, so there, this is a background for any development we do with smart cities and, and uh, green cities. We use a, that standard. Of course, we'll, I'll talk about standards in a minute. Uh, the current five-year plan of China is about smart cities, or one big part of it is smart cities that are integrated with agriculture. So it's like they're trying to green cities, smart cities. Uh, they grow food. They, 
they take care of waste and all those things, right? So that they're, that's their vision. Now implementing it, we, we all know implementing stuff like that is hard because different people understand things differently. Uh, I had a book that I used to use when I was teaching world history and the op opening preface it said, the meaning of history is determined in the day of judgment. I said, oh no, this is a dogmatic religious book. Then the next sentence is, the day of judgment is when you read it. <laughs> and when you read it, you know about the blind man and the elephant, we all see only part of our experience. So we interpret based on what we currently believe or used to believe. And we, we know, you know lots of people that do that, but we actually all do that. So we have to be continually learning. Okay, so this is a model of uh, using resources in full cycle. Remember waste management? So everything can be reused. And the planet only has a limited number of resources. If we waste them, then we don't have them. But they all can be recycled because there's nothing can be created or destroyed. It can only be transformed. So this is a model for reusing everything. And uh, I worked for a biomass conversion company, so that's kind of like a key item in this thing. Uh, it takes biomass, it heats it up to a high temperature, it becomes a gas, and then you separate all the gases into their elements, condense it back down, and then you have raw materials to use. It's expensive to build, but boy, it saves a lot of money, really. <laughs> but this is all about the whole cycle, right? So you don't have to convert everything with high temperature. Now this is, we have a lot of arguments about energy, you know, do we want to use coal, do we want to use atomic energy, do we want to use uh, uh, human energy? Well, actually, if we want to optimize our community, we need to use all of it. Some of it is only used for special things, but you know, every piece of it can be useful. Okay, standards. Now, I work a lot in standards, and I was the first editor of the Unicode standard, which puts all the language of the world into one standard, so that it can be used on any computer, uh, if you have the fonts. <laughs> so, um, but standards uh, and key performance indicators, how do you measure things? How do you get a measurement of what's good and what isn't? Or what, what is the result? Or what is it? How do you measure it? That's PKIs. And, one of the things that is difficult in China, but everywhere. If you're going to measure things and compare, if you don't have a standard, then you don't know if apples and oranges. It just How do you work together? So standards are very important. But then, you know, when I worked in China back in a while ago, you try to create a standard for, OK, how do you generate energy? How do you measure it? How do you exchange energy from one kind to another? And I would recommend they put solar roof, capture the wind, capture ground source geothermal, put them all together in a building, and then the building can share it with others in the community. And the people that translated it into Chinese said, what in the world are you talking about? The state grid controls everything. All energy is controlled by the state grid. So you know, trying to talk about a building managing its own energy is stupid. Uh, well, that was not too long ago. but. We know that it is stupid to not to think that way, but that's the model that they had. And Oliver's going to talk more about that. Okay, so then we want to create uh, green buildings, smart energy, smart communities, and smart people. And if you try to turn everything over to artificial intelligence, we're lost. We become a victim. We need to use artificial intelligence. It's a tool for us. But we have to make people smart, make cities smart, and so forth. OK, today's seminar plan is Oliver, you will talk next to compare AI applications to power systems in China and the US, comparing them. And how do we, are we going to be able to talk to each other? Next will be Wen Li Yu, the emergence of AI in Chinese smart cities. He's worked on a number of projects in the US and in China. He specializes in that making uh, systems that will 
measure it, control it, make it available to exchange, and so forth. And last, uh, fourth, was going to be uh, Yang Ming Li, who used to work for, or he still works for, I guess, the China National Gas Corporation. Um, but he used to work, work for them. Now he works for a company that he created that serves them. But he's also doing some smart city projects. Right? So we'll hear what, how he's managed to switch over to that or integrate those things. And then we'll have questions and discussions. Great, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Welcome. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name's Oliver Yu. Um, um, actually, Thanks. I'm a uh, fellow board member of an organization called uh, U.S. China Green Energy Council uh, with Jim. And uh, this uh, council promotes green energy between China and the U.S. So I'm also the uh, director for uh, Smart Grid uh, Task Force for that uh, council. And so uh, Jim is one is mainly uh, interested in uh, focusing on the uh, uh, smart city part of the Green Energy Council, and I was focusing mostly on the smart grid. And obviously, there are uh, connections between these two. Uh, however, that uh, uh, smart grid is mostly infrastructure, and uh, that can be also uh, distributed, and it can be also be centralized. So therefore, today, I'm going to talk about a comparison of artificial intelligence applications to power system in China and the US. First, I want to give you a little bit about my background. Uh, I have a uh, bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from uh, National Taiwan University and a master's degree in electrical engineering from uh, Georgia Tech. Then I have a PhD in uh, management science and engineering uh, from Stanford. Um, for many years, I worked for two research institutes. One is the Stanford Research Institute, which is now called SRI International. And the other one is uh, the Electric Power Research Institute. Both are the, uh, in the Bay Area. And uh, so um, at EPRI, Electric Power Research Institute, I was in charge of the uh, uh, planning and uh, analysis for the future changes in the energy industry, as well as the allocation of the funding from uh, uh, the utility industries um, to the researchers. So the Electric Power Research Institute is a research funding agency, very much like National Science Foundation. Uh, on the other hand, SRI International is a uh, uh, contract research institute. And uh, as probably many of you know, is one of the largest um, independent research institute and it was established by Stanford University in 1946. And over the last 70 some years, we had uh, over 3,000 breakthrough uh, event innovations. And some of them you're familiar. One is the mouse was invented by us, was before the, there was a PC in 1968. And so we licensed it to uh, Xerox Palo Alto Research Center and they could not uh, commercialize it either, uh, not until 1972 when uh, Steve Jobs uh, came to uh, uh, visit uh, Xerox Park and saw the prototype for PC and uh, also the mouse. So therefore, he was very much inspired and went home and uh, get ideal to prototype the mouse to what we have today. And 40 years later, we invented uh, the Siri which is the forerunner of all these artificial intelligence you use in Lexa and from Google and uh, from um, Amazon. It is the voice uh, uh, recognition system and command system. So uh, when I was there, I was also uh, in charge of uh, energy and technology strategies for uh, uh, various power companies in the world. And uh, also, I uh, visit China uh, quite often. And uh, so, so what are the differences between uh, China and the US? Well, they're fundamentally different in the following way. For 4,000 years, 
since the Qin dynasty, the one who the, built the Great Wall and the one who gave China the unified characters, uh, the words we use today, and also give us the name China came from Qin. Okay, that's why it's called China, and has always been a centralized plant economy, centralized plant system, even to today, and the China under the uh, the uh, uh, President Xi. Okay, on the other hand, uh, the U.S. over the last two hundred, almost two hundred fifty years, has generally been a decentralized. Uh, system and also a decentralized um, economy. Okay, So those are the fundamental differences between these two. And so when I was working on the <coughs> smart grid, and the in the US, we're talking about how to apply smart grid to distributed systems. Okay, and, But in China, they don't like the word smart grid. What they want to call is called a strong grid. Basically, they want a centralized grid that would uh, uh, really control the entire system. Uh, this can be exemplified when I was first time went back to China. I was born in China, but then I left in China in 1949. And I went back to China in 1978 as a delegate for the uh, uh, US energy and power uh, industry. And when we went to visit that time, in Chengdu, um, they have this uh, control system. Okay. And uh, so I went with uh, people in the US power industries at that time. And uh, so the first question we were asked by the Chinese uh, professionals in the power control system in Chengdu is that how do we, how can we learn from you to pull people's plugs. In other words, we will have power shortage. Our ideal system would be if we have a line go to each household, when there's a shortage, I can just shut off the electricity <laughs> supply. And so we will not have overall blackout. We have small blackouts. And uh, so the uh, US uh, utility, power utility people were really feeling aghast. They say, we could not do that in the US because we would get sued by the customers. Okay? And um, then the, the Chinese power control people say, they cannot sue us. We are the country. <laughs> We're the government. Okay? There's no way to sue us. And uh, we are protecting them because we don't want to have widespread blackouts. So therefore, we want a direct control for every user. Okay? So that's exemplify the kind of difference in the philosophy about how to run the power system and how to apply technology. Okay. Now that's also uh, exemplified that uh, there are mainly two major grid. One is the state grid company, as meant, uh, Jim mentioned earlier, which is about 80% of the Chinese uh, control system, and there's a southern grid, which is in the south part of uh, in, in Guang, uh, centralizing Guangdong system, Guangdong province. And again, that uh, they want to uh, have mainly direct control of uh, all the uh, all the users in the uh, in the system. Um, in contrast, in the United States, gradually, first of all, we have many many more of grid system. Um, and we have nine regional reliability council. Within the reliability council, we, each one has uh, uh, several uh, major uh, power grids. So therefore, we have uh, many more decentralized uh, power control system. And also, in recent years, there has been a very strong movement towards a distributed system. And that, that really is a, one of the first major revolution in the electric power industry. As we all know that in early days, that uh, 
Electric power companies in the U.S. are monopolies. They're called regional monopolies. They, uh, they, there was a bargain that was constructed by uh, a famous uh, person named, uh, uh, he was the, uh, uh, his name suddenly escaped my uh, uh, memory. He was the secretary to uh, Thomas Edison. And then uh, he, uh, he's from England, and he came as uh, secretary for Thomas Edison. Then he stopped to think. There's a very uh, ludicrous, I'm sorry, <laughs> very uh, uh, lucrative uh, way to make money. And uh, that would be to create regional electric power monopolies by uh, working with the government to say that um, the power companies will supply reliable electricity. So the bargain is that power company in the US will supply reliable uh, electricity in exchange for the uh, mm -hmm. uh, monopolistic rate, uh, rate system, electric rate system. And you so a therefore, faster, please. A little faster, please. Okay. So therefore, there, there's a major difference between the, uh, that time we have a centralized power system. Then later on, when we have these uh, uh, renewables, we have these uh, independent power producers, then the customers start to generate power by itself. Therefore, we have now a much more decentralized system. And uh, uh, so that's a major revolution in the uh, power industry and the cost of the decentralization as well as the uh, deregulation of the power industry. And uh, so that has not happened in, uh, in China. So if we look at some of the research they are doing today, applying artificial intelligence in China versus the United States. In China, basically, they want to strengthen the centralized system. And in the uh, US, they want to really to start to build the distributed system. So those will be the uh, two major differences in the uh, application of AI. And however, I see there is a movement uh, towards decentralization in, the, in China as well, largely for the second revolution in the power industry. That is the, we call it edge computing. I don't know anyone is familiar with that. The edge computing basically distributed computing, and that is now forcing the centralized system to be much more decentralized. So echoing what uh, uh, Jim will be talking about, this uh, China dream. The China dream is to have a harmonious society, to have really uh, well smart energy, smart buildings, and smart uh, communication and smart environment. And uh, so that maybe gradually will be a convergence of the centralized and the distributed system. The only caveat I want to mention is that the smart, the, I'm sorry, the China dream, which was promoted by President Xi, is very different from the American dream. <laughs> we are here in America, when we talk about American dream, what is it? To most of us is that we will be individually become wealthy and have home, have a, uh, uh, money, and so on. We can really <laughs> enjoy ourselves. In China, the China dream is for the country to be strong, to be leader in the world, not the individuals. As you can see, that lies the difference between these two systems. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So we'll have to think about, it. I mean, is this so, this looks to me like it's too complicated for central to control, <laughs> right? <laughs> so there has to be a way, and, and people too selfish, they're gonna cause problems as well, right? So we need to think about the community. But only, uh, I might help you find it or? Yeah. Sorry, I'll wait. All right. 
Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Wen Li Yu. Just a little bit background first. I'm currently the CEO of Archimedes Controls. What Archimedes Controls does is we provide a security services for data centers. Data centers are fundamental infrastructure for making cloud and the big data. So, so it's, a, it's a physical uh, buildings or infrastructures where you put all your servers or network switching equipment, fiber optics all together. And uh, if you have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of those things, they form a cloud, which connects all your mobile phones, smart devices all together. That's what they do. Uh, the data centers. So we provide security for data centers. So I'm a current CEO. Before the, uh, Archimedes, uh, I was a general manager and the legal <coughs> representative for JDSU in China. For some of you may not be familiar with JDSU, JDSU is a California <coughs> Mill Peters based company. In a long time ago, in the 2000s, JDSU was similar to today's Google's. That was uh, the, the single largest market cap company in the world. Um, today is a little bit different story. So I spent about nine years in, uh, in China going back and forth. I was an expat and uh, sent to China. So uh, build the China organizations and uh, business and the sales marketing also <coughs> in uh, other parts of the countries. So uh, I uh, had uh, my uh, um, um, Fortunate times in the spending years of seeing how China developed from uh, 2006 and uh, when I returned back to the U.S. It was, uh, uh, nine years later. So uh, I would like to share with you some of uh, my experience and uh, what I saw when I was in China. Then prior to uh, JDS Uniface, I was uh, <coughs> uh, uh, CEO and the chairman for three startup companies and backed by Silicon Valley and the Boston venture capitalists. And uh, we're fortunate uh, enough and uh, the, the three startups were acquired. One of them was a semiconductor company and mm -hmm. another was uh, networking uh, companies and another was a uh, internet related companies. Excuse me, is the microphone working okay? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Oh, that's good. And uh, prior to that, and uh, I uh, my training and uh, was an electrical uh, engineer, and uh, so did my some uh, initial hardware designs and uh, always equipment equipment from electronics to another electronics, and uh, spent eleven years and uh, then uh, worked my way to uh, product management and uh, had a lot of opportunity working with uh, all three largest U.S. carriers. In, uh, in the U.S. from uh, East Coast to West Coast. When I was based in the East Coast. And uh, then uh, I also, uh, um, uh, also yeah, uh, there's a uh, limited partners and advisors for a couple of venture capitalists and also startup companies. So um, that's uh, basically my background. So um, today the topic is uh, we're talking about artificial intelligence. So I'd like to share some of my view about AI. So to me, AI is not different okay. than HAI, human intelligence. So let's think about this one. So in my opinion, artificial mm -hmm. intelligence is not a science or technology by itself alone. It relies on many, many other technologies, like human intelligence. Human intelligence is not just developed by let, reading the books, reading the books, uh, feeding the knowledges. And uh, starting from a baby, baby does not develop enough intelligence just by feeding baby something because the physical development is also a very important part of it. Physical development helps the intelligence development and the vice versa as well. So we're talking about machine learnings in the uh, AI. I think it's going to happen in the same way. So. Um, that, that's my opinion. I, I, there's no way a uh, few of us can work on some artificial intelligence. It involves all the sciences, from medicines, from biotech, from computers, from electrical, from, I think from many, many areas. So that's the basis for my uh, today's talk. And I would like to uh, set the foundations for why I mentioned some of this stuff. So based on 
what my <laughs> philosophy is, you need to build an infrastructure which will feed you to build a next generation of artificial intelligence. <laughs> so what we need are uh, many, many things. It's like uh, developing a baby to a super smart person, right? You need to help them. You, probably the baby needs to learn music or need, uh, learn another language or do something. Uh, mm -hmm. Everything helps build intelligence. So, um, um, so, so I'd like to share some of the knowledge I have seen, and uh, some I read it, up, but most of them I actually feel like I see when I spent nine years in China, back and forth between Washington, D.C. and uh, China. So I saw some of the things. In China, a lot of things, I, I, I want to outline some of the things you don't see that many often here. But in China, quite visible. Maybe some of you have a different views. So that, that's perfectly fine. And they help me to develop my knowledge base. Um, for example, the, all the sensors for traffic controls, here we start seeing all these cameras and stuff. In China, that happens quite a long ago. Ten years ago, they already stopped putting all the sensors on every street and the controls. Ten years ago, the street lights always already LEDs. When I came back in the US, we're still using light bulbs or fluorescent light bulbs. In China, it's already LEDs. It happens very, very quickly. Once they have LED developers, it looks like all of a sudden, I went to every shop, so I thought, wow, it's all, all these spotlights, everything's all LED. How could that happen very fast? Because uh, uh, part of the reason was uh, China has that tendency where some things are hot, they, everybody goes after that. Then plus the government incentives, that also helps. Now, long term, maybe a little bit different story, but that's what it is. Um, uh, the the uh, the parking you drive into the parking garage like I did it today. So I'm trying to find an empty spot in China. You almost everywhere you go into it will tell you how many empty slots there. And then there's a red lights and the green lights on each of the spot. You, you just follow the sign, and it's very easy. So you don't have to driving around to find it. Those things that happens in the eight, seven, nine years ago. And since I left the China in, uh, three years ago, so 10 years ago, they're already there. And uh, it's not just one place or two places, it's many, many places, many, many cities. Um, security cameras, everybody, uh, I think there are hundreds and millions of security cameras in China. Somebody uh, from the US and did an experiment, tried to escape, and they found that there's no way because there's a camera and uh, chasing them everywhere. You concluded that there's no way I can escape in China if I did something better. Um, facial recognition, that's uh, another part of the fundamental technologies for mm -hmm. building mm -hmm. artificial intelligence. And uh, I, I can tell you, in 2006, when I landed in Shanghai, I uh, found a company, <laughs> and uh, they said they're working on facial recognition. And in 2006, it was pretty early. Wasn't that popular? I went to visit them. They said, yeah, we're developing software. I said, who, who will need this thing? What's that useful? They said, oh, a US company needs that. So that was in 2006. A small company in Shanghai was developing facial recognition for a US customer. I don't know who that is. They wouldn't show me. They wouldn't tell me who that is. <laughs> so, um, so all these things that happen, and uh, you, you, why you see all these things happen. Uh, can help the artificial intelligence in the smart city. Low cost of 3G, 4G mobile services in China happens also a long time ago. Everybody buy these little SIM cards and they plug it in with a USB dongle so they can take your computers everywhere. That helps to connecting all the IoT devices together to build a foundation for artificial intelligence, big data analytics. You need all the sensors everywhere. So. What, what, what do you need? You need a battery to power these wireless sensors. You also need a wireless connections to connect all of them together. So these things also happen quite rapidly. Solar wind energy, and the city I was living in, Shenzhen, I'm pretty sure other cities had the same thing, that the whole street was 30, 40 miles long, and all the street lights were powered by the combination of solar and the wind. Because during the daytime, they use the solar, at the night time, it's a wind. It's a pretty fascinating. And uh, transportation, high speed trains, everybody learn about EVs. Uh, I, I actually went to Shenzhen for, uh, four months ago, in July, I believe. And uh, they told me, I, I, before I say 
I saw probably 10% of the taxes are EVs, electrical vehicles. This time, almost a half of that. They said by next mm -hmm. year, this time, and 100% of the taxes will be electrical. So um, mobile payments, everybody probably heard about this in China. You don't need, really need a cash. And uh, from tier one to tier three cities, it's almost uh, every city has a smart city programs and the mandates. Um, smart cars are self-driving, and uh, Baidu, all these companies are doing that pretty, uh, pretty amazing. And uh, also a lot of small companies doing uh, very well. And I want to talk about one thing. I, I talk about the data center. So here's a status number. US and China, two countries, have 55% of the data center worldwide. US has 45% of the data center globally. China has 10%. So these two countries occupy pretty much 50%, 55% of the data centers worldwide. In the last three years, more than half of the new data centers built by Microsoft. Why? Because everybody uploading your PowerPoints documentations to 360. So they need to build the data centers everywhere in the world. So more than half of the new data centers are Microsoft. OK, so uh, uh, investment in China, I want to quickly go through this one. These are the highlights for where the government or the private Money is uh, went into it, national high-speed train building backbone. So that, that's uh, pretty much uh, completed. They are adding more segments here, there. But the backbone is already there. Uh, subway systems are almost that I see in all the major cities. They all have uh, uh, subway systems. Then uh, uh, the big cities are adding one more than the small cities, the second tier, third tier. So they are actually start building uh, uh, subway systems. 4G, 5G is uh, it's a pretty amazing everywhere, and uh, except the U.S. travel is a little bit painful because uh, our chips don't work there. Um, low cost is another thing, and uh, 10 RMB and uh, for months, that's uh, about less than $2 a month. You can have a little mobile data devices that will connect your mobile device to somewhere in the cloud. Um, Smart grid development, and uh, Oliver just uh, talked about. And uh, mm -hmm. local EPAs are putting lots and lots of monitoring points in every major cities, down to every county, to want to build a network so they can trace and monitor, manage the pollution. Um, lots and lots of uh, government sponsorships and the programs, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. plus a lot. And the AR and the machine learning, all these things are happening at the same time. So, mm -hmm. to conclude my uh, report, basically, all these things, the little things here, there, there, all these uh, actually become a big investment to form the next generation, to support the next generation of artificial intelligence. It's mm -hmm. all needed. So, don't bend on hope for one thing can make that happen. So, uh, last minute. And I would like to share two programs, Project Archimedia Controls, and actually uh, uh, work together with our sales channel partners in China. We actually, last year, we, uh, actually this year, we actually installed uh, our uh, smart monitoring system for 35 corn granary warehouses in China. I wouldn't mention where it is, and uh, before that, it's all manually down. So green, these are big greenhouses. Each one is about 60 meters long, which is about 180 feet long, and uh, 20, uh, 60 feet uh, wide, then uh, 8 meter, which is uh, 24 feet tall. These are huge ones. Then they just uh, dump the corn. You see these little windows on the top. There's no, then you just uh, dump all your, your weeds or whatever corns inside it. And we help them to develop a monitoring system for 24 by 7 to feed all their big data analytics with artificial intelligence. So they can predict, uh, for example, if the surrounding areas, the, the forest, uh, caught a fire. So they know that. So they can actually warn all, the, warn all these places, hey, there's a 10 miles away, there's a forest fire, there's a campfire, you need to do something about it. 
So we saw the data available everywhere from every center, every census. Then it helps the people to build your intelligence. There's a lot of imagination you can <laughs> help to do that. Another thing I'd like to uh, mention, uh, and uh, also uh, uh, early last year, and uh, we worked with the US DOE out of Washington, DC. And uh, why, uh, uh, the, the things I didn't know about that, US DOE and the China DOE actually had a joint program after both Obama and uh, I believe it was Xi Jinping sign off of a Paris Agreement a year ago. So mm -hmm. both countries had a joint program. The condition was China will provide the market, US will provide the technology and the products. The condition for U.S. participants is uh, everything must be designed, developed, and built in the U.S. You cannot have any Chinese uh, components in it. Everything must be built mm -hmm. in the U.S. So China agreed on that. So we participated on this uh, program, and uh, we actually won a uh, deal through, uh, with the help from the DOE, U.S. DOE. So mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to share with you. Uh, this is, uh, we help a customs build a data center to save about 24% of energy as a part of the okay. smart city programs. So Great. that concludes uh, my uh, sharing. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. It's amazing how much has been done. But I have to remember our Note, and we'll talk about this later. I was trying to sell LED streetlights to cities in China in 2006 and seven. Shenzhen already had it, you said, but Beijing did not, and Hunan did not, and even Shanghai did not. So we were, you know, it's, it doesn't all happen at once. No, but no. great progress. Yeah, China is a very, very China is yeah. a huge market, but yeah, it's a right. fragment of the market. Yeah, so right. don't. Don't think, uh, oh, it's a big market in China. Yeah, it is a big, like a restaurant. So it's a huge market, but you still have to deal with each individual restaurant. So there's no way you can own all the restaurant business. Right. That's so what now we have uh, Yang Ming Li, who's lived a lot in China, worked with the <laughs> gas company, power and power, and all. He's got a lot of experience. OK, hello, so, everyone. Yeah, Good afternoon. Uh, I come from China. I work in. China National Petroleum Corporation. And I'm lucky here, I'm a, a visiting fellow in Asia Pacific Center um, here. My background is I started my job as a, a computer programmer in system management uh, from the 1980s. In, in that time, I worked for CNPC, China National Petroleum Corporation. We have the bridges, the mine frame in China in <laughs> bought from IBM. This uh, picture I took from the Silicon uh, Computer History Museum. In this kind of uh, computers, we have many kinds of it. In from 2001 to, two, to now, in, I work in an uh, IT company. That time, in 2001, I found there's a very big challenges for IT technologies maybe like this time for AI technology. There are many new startups in IT areas, especially in e-commerce markets. As you know, mm -hmm. it's Jack Ma's, Alibaba. At that time, there are many new <coughs> startups, and many certainly they are broke down. And then the late time, I, find, I found an IT company, IBM. It is a rich fit uh, IT technology companies. And then it, this company has become uh, the biggest uh, oil uh, IT companies. It's about uh, 3,000 staffs in our company. And we have opened some uh, companies in, um, in Dubai, in Canada, in Kazakhstan. And this is the data center is uh, run by RichFit. It's maybe one of the biggest company owned a uh, data center, private data center. This is uh, maybe one of the, maybe it's the top 10. And Richie has uh, focused on digital smart uh, oil feed solution for many years. It performs live scale 
life cycle management of full space real time oil exploration in production so that the make business process can be optimized. In CMPC Freeway Cloud is uh, one of the biggest uh, data center. But it's in my view, the smart architecture is the same. Smart oil within in smart cities have the same data types of data processes. You have to do acquisition, transmission, analysis, and then at last to give instructions to uh, make your equipment in let your companies or your cities more uh, safe to running. Which is join tens of China smart city contrasting projects. On the one hand, cities are looking for comprehensive strong companies to take the lead in projects. Because smart cities, they are very different areas, very complicated. You have to link all the data to let them to in the same platform. So always you have to, re to design the total projects. On the other hand, Richfield decided to expand its business outside our industry. So I go, our company is start our uh, smart uh, city projects. Smart city projects. Yes, okay. Good. And this is a smart city architecture. All the same. Maybe there are many different kinds of uh, smart cities uh, playing, but all this, uh, that's similar. The lower is the hardware, is the infrastructure is to make the, uh, all things to perception, communication, and then have a cloud computing data center there. Yeah. In the data layers, the main function is to do the data exchange statements and then to, all the data is uh, have the same standard and to store in the same uh, data center. Sometimes distribution it must have the same data uh, standards there. In application layers, uh, always different because uh, you have to build the system or AI system or IT structure for the, comp for the city's needs. Different cities have their different urban development plan. Maybe some cities near uh, beautiful scenery, they want to develop tourism. So you, some cities have focus on the smart tourism. In some cities maybe near port. And then you have to build a smart port for the city. This is different uh, kinds of applications. In the top of the layer is, is uh, city operations and command centers. Before, uh, now there are many uh, cities are uh, building up this kind of uh, centers. They collect all the data together. And let different departments of people to work together in the same uh, big room. And sometimes uh, the cities, uh, sometimes the cities commandment is very big. Many, many videos, many screens there. And this is the smart city's architecture. And what happens in China's smart cities? Before the, some speeches is talking about this, uh, also I just quickly uh, go through about it. There are about more than 500 smart cities under construction, but I think almost every city in China are starting or have been started to work with the smart city. Sometimes I meet with some mayors before in Lin, they all are talking about the AI, talking about the cloud computing, about the smart cities. Tell true, tell true, they have no any idea about the IT, <laughs> about the AI. <laughs> But yeah. they always hope to make their city to be more smart, to be developed more uh, sustainable. So uh, if you, if there are many big challenges that you can go to uh, for IT people or for the, to go to, to go to any cities to talk with really high level uh, mayors and officers there. 
In you know about the Alibaba's city point projects, now they have using they are using AI algorithms to make some uh, to take over the control of the signal lights. And then you can mm -hmm. video, you can always uh, can detect the accidents. Uh, so this uh, pilot said uh, last year, Alibaba is chief in uh, Hangzhou uh, cities. The last uh, the accuracy is um, uh, to to find some accidents is about ninety more than ninety percent accuracy. Uh, it's much better than before. And there's a small example for rich fit we have uh, achieved in uh, Fuyuan city. It's a very very small city in China, uh, only about uh, one hundred twelve thousand uh, populations there. Located near Russian border, but presidency two years ago has been to this small city. But the mayor, I meet with him many times. They decide to to make very big investment in smart cities to catch up with the total uh, growing fast in AI areas. But the main deliverables for this. Uh, uh, projects is uh, design of the smart cities IT infrastructure in plane. Yes, before I just say the little measures, mayors and ministers in cities they have no any idea about IT. But so they always some companies when they are in have some plane or maybe some projects. But I think the most important is to make a. Uh, Total uh, IT plane or AI plane for the city to according to his uh, urban developing, development plan. Mm -hmm. So the first is the is uh, the plane in lane is uh, we build the control and command center in data center in now the data center is run by uh, Fuyan uh, himself. In mm -hmm. always we build some city management in service systems full. Huyan Smart City's first step is to make a unified plan and build a unified data center in control center. I think after the first pilot projects, the next step, with the help of integrated platforms and collected data, the smart city will come true. So uh, I just give a brief introduction. But because this, uh, 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 class is uh, topic is about AI, but I think AI in China, especially in smart city, is just to begin. First, uh, about uh, uh, ten years, more than ten years, every city is talking about a smart city just to build the software platform to collect the data together, to convert their management process into the uh, computer uh, platform. And now, I think this is just the begin uh, to AI technologies. Mm -hmm. So this is my uh, speech. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, it's, it's getting popular. It's, getting, it's making a difference. But it's very complicated, right? There are lots of data that have to be managed. And how do we get people and computers to work together for a better result? So what questions do you have for the speakers? Yes? Any fundamental agreement on the uh, structure of the data and the interfaces that are needed? Any protocols that are new that we would benefit from? I'd like to hear a little bit about that. The interfaces between all the data systems. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's been pretty much, I mean, we're getting standardizing it, but you want to answer yeah, that can, one, yeah? Yeah, I can uh, just uh, speak uh, from uh, my perspective. Currently, there's, a, as far as I can tell, there's no specific interface standards just for smart city. 
and uh, the smart city application just adopted what's already existed, and uh, a lot of them are from um, ITU, from A to Z. ITU got tons of students, start from A.1, A.2, all the way to Z, a few hundreds, and uh, that defines uh, most of the standard interfaces uh, between how the device can communicate. For example, TCP IP is one of them. Everybody uses that. So mm -hmm. there's no need to develop it. But I do agree. I do think they should develop something which is not there. Today, there's really no standards between smart devices. This one can plug into the other one, unless you use one of these typical communications standards protocol interface. Even the connectors might be different, but I, mm. I think as time goes on, if there's a consortium can build the ones, will definitely help. Yeah, so standards, I mean, I have a lot of experience with standards, even trying to get language, all different languages on one computer. If you don't agree on a standard, you can't do it. And if you already have carved out your space, then you think, this is my space. But what we learned from building Unicode is that when we use standards, actually everybody makes more money, they get more done, and they are happier about the results. So standards are critical. But at this stage, I mean, they're just trying something new, right? So what is your experience, Emily? Yeah. Uh, in China, yeah, it's a very difficult to, there are too many uh, kinds of data. Uh, <laughs> but in China, it's, uh, I think it's different uh, uh, from the United States because many things are uh, opposed by the government. So many, always, some, uh, always uh, sometimes the government will, will take some uh, new standards. And many uh, companies are run by SOE companies, big companies. Mm -hmm. So the standards can be, uh, can be uh, 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 widely, can be used widely. Mm -hmm. So in now the some big companies set up a data exchange platform there, mm -hmm. according to the uh, according to the national standards or industry standards, or for cities mm -hmm. uh, standards. So I think uh, so. Uh, in my view, in China, in future, I think it's much easier to push all the new AI mm -hmm. technologies mm -hmm. because. Uh, Data uh, first uh, have been uh, standardized. Mm -hmm. So China, it's much easier, as you said, um, and yet they have their own language, their own way of doing things, and they want to be part of the rest of the world. So we do need to have international standards, and I'm finding in the building standards, <coughs> right, you got LEED standards and you got ASHRAE standards and then China has their own standards. And they're trying to find ways to make them work together to synchronize them. But one standard can be translated into another. Once you do that, then everybody can work together. IBM had petabytes of data in, in Arabic and other languages that they had invented a coding system. But they joined the Unicode Consortium after they realized that, well, they had all that done, but they still needed to work with the rest of the world. So they joined us, they put in millions of dollars to help us develop that standard. And uh, of course, we had to compromise with their standard too, find a translation for it. Yes. Um, you guys didn't talk a lot about autonomous uh, vehicles. Uh, but it, it would appear that China would have a great advantage uh, because it's actually building brand new cities from scratch. And in the U.S., you know, you're going to go to 1% of the cars in a particular city being autonomous mm -hmm. and eventually at some point in 20 years or 30 years, 100% being autonomous. But China doesn't have to worry about that problem in brand new cities. It can just say that all the cars will either be autonomous or all the cars will be censored. So if they're not autonomous, they actually can talk to other cars. Mm -hmm. um, what's the perspective in terms of local transport and autonomous vehicles, shared vehicles? Uh, and do you, do you see China 
mm -hmm. taking advantage of the fact that it's got brand new cities that don't have the old infrastructure right. and having to work with two different set of standards. Well, they're building new... It's not totally from scratch new cities. They're converting their cities. But one of the things, I mean, autonomous vehicles are not the future. They're part of the future. But they're building high-speed rail. They're building, uh, you know, better uh, communities where people can walk to work or they can walk walk to the shop and so forth. Too many cars, autonomous or not, they're going to be a headache. Yeah. Right. But, but China's still the biggest producer of cars in the world. Right. Close biggest producer of cars in the world. The, the I'm not sure. Producer of cars in the world. Producers. I'm not sure. Pardon? I said producers. Producer. <laughs> producer. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Consumers, right? They're the biggest consumption of cars. I think something like 18 to 20 million cars a year. The U.S. is actually used to be number one, but it isn't. Yeah. So. Yeah, but they have 1.4 billion people. <laughs> right? So it's not everybody has a car, or even half. So it, it's a, something, I mean, the, it, the problem is to think more broadly. Autonomous vehicles, yes, that's part of the solution. High-speed rail is part of the solution, right? Um, better subways and better public transit, all those things have to work together. The public transit issue is the last mile. But, you know, when I was living in Beijing, when Jeanette and I were living there in 1980, we could get everywhere faster on bicycle than by bus or taxi. And when I went back in 86, 87, it's still, public transportation was better, but driving, I wouldn't want to drive there. I mean, the traffic is so bad, right? I'd much rather use public transit if I could. And in fact, when I moved to New York City, I sold my car. I mean, who wants a car in New York City? Right? It's just a headache. People break into it. You can't get anywhere anyway. It's just a headache. I'd much rather ride the trolley or ride the subway and so forth. So we need to think more broadly about that, right? Yeah, I don't think uh, autonomous vehicles are going to become a massive transportation tools in near term. I, I think uh, it's just like artificial intelligence. It takes a bunch of adjacent technology to be developed at the same times. And also, uh, today, if you look at uh, the, the, the safety measurements, we put it in every single car today, actually was a result of how from many, many years, how many people were killed. Right? Then each time we develop a little bit more, add another safety issue, uh, change the law, or the traffic controls, or the street lights, or, or designed. Today, none of those things are designed for, even our legal system, the court system, none of those things are designed for autonomous drive, self driving car at a massive scale, what I'm talking about. Now, there's always a sweet spot, niche markets, mm. maybe you can use it here, there. But when I would say 80% of the cars are self-driving, I think uh, it's going to take a time. And uh, there's a big hurdle is the legal system. Mm -hmm. Insurance, well, yeah. legal, traffic control, there's so many things. It, 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 it takes to kill, it, as, long, as soon as it kills a few people, <laughs> people yeah. will pull that back. So I yeah. think a niche market is always, everything has its a niche market. But, become a massive vehicle, so it's going to take, uh, somebody I think I was just on the way I was here, so somebody from here said uh, it's going to be next 20 years. It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. But I well, don't know I think I there's a niche that. market for autonomous vehicles is getting from home to the train station, getting home to the bus station, right? Or, or maybe in your community or something. Yeah, or, right. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe inside the airport, I don't know. And if we yeah. could eliminate half of the parking spaces, we have that much more housing space. <laughs> you know, I was at the Silicon Valley Community Center last night, and the housing is a major headache in Silicon Valley. They've got more and more and more jobs, but no place for people to live that they can afford. Yeah. So we have to think a bit more about, uh, you know, eliminating parking spaces, building more livable spaces, and then 
transit back and forth. Yeah, I think the technology yeah. is a one side of a story. I, yeah. I'm, I, I still believe legal is uh, another side of the story. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Without both sides, uh, things uh, cannot move forward. OK. Yes? Uh, my understanding is in, in the big cities in China, most people live in dense housing, high rise. Maybe 95% of the people, which is much different than single family housing here. How do, so, and, and you just mentioned we need, you know, we may need more dense housing here to handle the, mm -hmm. the, the issues we have here. But how do people in China feel about the U.S. Uh, single family housing instead of dense housing? So, so, it's odd. Yeah, so I understand the question. So a lot of people ask me that question. So first of all, let me say a few things. You have to really compare Apple to Apple. So the people saying, people in China are living in high-rise uh, high apartments, they are talking about the big city in China, Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen. It's the equivalent we're talking about San Francisco city or New York city. Yeah, most of the people live in <laughs> high-rise apartments or condos. But the rural areas, uh, residents are a little bit different in a single family or townhouse. townhouse. In China, it's the same situation. So if you compare the tier one city, big city to big city, they all live in the, <laughs> mostly living in a uh, uh, high rise. But if you're talking about countryside, <laughs> some rural areas, uh, it's a, it's a, maybe the quality is different, uh, but it's all individual houses. In China, it's the same situation. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a book by, called Happy Cities by Charles Montgomery. One of the things that he discovered by comparing cities around the world for a happiness factor, if people can live upstairs, go downstairs and shop, and go out to a nearby park and meet with their friends, they're much happier. They have more time to do those things than trying to drive somewhere. So that's uh, something that China has, big cities already has, down first floor is stores, right? Yeah. Right. They, they then, just have a more cities like in New York yeah. <laughs> than the U.S. And New York has. Too, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. I think I want to give a little bit different perspective. Okay. You know, Good. if a small city in China, we're talking about five million people. And <laughs> here we have a San Jose. <laughs> you know, and so yeah. it's, it's different. Because here we have San Jose, you have huge land, but a, probably a couple billion people. Yeah. So it's San Jose has different. one million. Right. Wait. So uh... <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Considering you know oh. the population of China, and um, you know very fast growth of let's say smart cities, and AI, what will happen to the prospect of job, and also centrally controlled every data? Then what will happen to people's privacy? Is there going to be any backlash because of these two reasons in future? Or have you ever thought over it? What will happen, let's say, in 30 years, 25 years? My perspective uh, of China is basically they are very centralized in the monitoring of people. And uh, so face through facial dis uh, recognition and many other things, uh, right now, in fact, uh, they will be able to detect whether you participate in any undesirable activities. Then, uh, from there, then you will have been will be not be able to travel. Mm -hmm. You will not be able to get a good education. You're not going to be able to get a good job. Mm -hmm. So, to me, it's 1984 in real life. It could happen in that way, and I think the control is. In some way, people think it's necessary because it's such a large com country, and uh, stability is extremely important for the country. Mm -hmm. So I think that part of the AI will be very, very fast developing. Yeah. Well, we also have, even in San Jose, they're creating four times as many jobs every year as housing units. So people, if they get a job, they have no place to live. They have to commute from the East Bay, or they have to try to, a lot of people become homeless. They just can't afford to live there, because 
more jobs but not enough places to live. So people would rather have a place to live that's close to their work and their family and, and friends. So being crowded is okay if it's convenient, right? And AI can help with that. I mean, look at all the stuff that's done with traffic, right? When I was living in Beijing, people would turn off their lights at night when they're driving because they didn't want to blind the other driver. <laughs> <laughs> and they, it would, but getting anywhere was a major headache because they didn't even understand technology of driving cars on the street. So, you know, technology can help with that, artificial intelligence and, and human intelligence, right? We have to learn what works, what doesn't. Yeah. And certainly, I always loved riding my bike everywhere because I got there faster than by any other way, <laughs> unless it's far away, yeah. The, the, the thing was amazing to me was uh, the human's ability to learn, to adapt some new things amazing fast. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, in the early 80s, right, uh, I, I saw some uh, plans, as a, for example, in Shanghai, big city, they, they wanted to build 3,000 high rise buildings. First thing I thought, uh, gee, they never built such a, how can they find the, 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 the people to design the buildings to build it? You never did it this way, you're only building one story, two stories in your lifetime, so many. How can you all of a sudden want to build a 50s? for buildings, you never done that. But amazing enough, most of the people, the first generation of these building workers, they never done anything like that, but they did it. So mm -hmm. that amazes me, you never did mm -hmm. this one, I wouldn't give this job to you. But since nobody has it, so it takes <laughs> whoever the bravest one and says, I do it, I tried it, okay, you try it. And uh, they eventually probably after a few times they failed and they did it this way. So now after 20, 30 years, it's like a building, a 100-story building in China is uh, no brain. <laughs> Almost anybody can do yeah. it. So uh, amazingly, yeah, yeah. it's not just China. I think in the U.S. the same yeah, of thing. Course. So yeah. human has a amazing ability to learn new things, even mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. I never did that before. Yeah. I think you had a question, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, so with the standardization of control here, do you have mechanisms for keeping updated and keeping the system modern? Yeah. With the Do you understand the question? No. Sorry. Yeah, just I just I told about the smart cities all this all be built by the big companies. For example, by SOE is a state-owned company. And we have uh, a nation, uh, our country always uh, in every uh, industry have uh, standards there. And then we just told we, we have uh, built uh, some kind of uh, data exchange yeah. platform yeah, yeah. On, the, on, on, in the system, in a, on the platform. In all the data, uh, uh, have, we have the link to, to, to exchange it data with the data platform. And then mm -hmm. uh, work uh, is, is OK. So first, uh, we have standards. And then we have a platform, data exchange mm -hmm. pl platform for, for, uh, for data yeah. exchanges. So you don't worry about monopoly or? Some uh, some, sometimes they almost uh, there's, uh, <coughs> there's a group or there's a team for uh, this kind of uh, uh, organization. In yeah. this uh, this t this group of people, they always uh, to change, modify. Maybe there are some new some uh, new needs coming. And you have to modify the codes inside the platform in the. Pre in the platform is to sell to all mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. all the companies uh, to, for example, maybe there is a new project for the one city, and there are many companies to work for that city, right? And then all the all the companies come here have to exchange the data with the data center, mm -hmm. is to exchange with the data code platform layer. So there is this kind mm -hmm. of platform layer. Well, I think one of the issues 
I mean, China is changing so fast. And China has this um, concept called Weiji. The word for crisis in Chinese means danger and opportunity. So it's like, look at the danger and you freeze and you lose. You look at the opportunity, you grab it, and you move, a, move ahead. But there are big companies everywhere, right? And too much of a monopoly can be a problem. I mean, look at the American oil companies. They kept, you know, British Petroleum changed their name to Beyond Petroleum. But did they move Beyond Petroleum? No, because they've been doing it the old way. So a lot of people get stuck in their old way of doing things, and a big company is harder to change. But things are changing so fast nowadays that, that we have to really adopt that attitude. Fail it forward. Move ahead. Look for the opportunity. Try it out. Right? Yeah, most of the state-owned enterprises are monopolies. I think Mr. Lee's uh, China yeah. National Petroleum Company is yeah. also a monopoly. And there's not so many different kinds of brands for oil, uh -huh. I guess. But they learn to adapt anyway. Right. Well, that's good. OK, I think you had a question. And then, yeah. yeah. My understanding has been so for the smart city projects, there is always government funding and then also some kind of sponsorship from the government. So has there been in China any smart city project where there has been no government involvement? So you have already evolved a kind of a profitable business model where only private companies are now actually beginning to engage with the city. Yes. Yeah. You can answer smart cities in China. <laughs> yeah. Any, any profitable smart cities in China? Private funded. Private oh, yeah. Funded. Privately funded. Shanghai uh -huh. The problem is for Alibaba is a private company. So mean yeah, there are yeah. many, uh, they allow there are some uh, private companies, they are more creative. So yeah. they allow there are many projects are always are built by uh, public companies and private companies together. Public yeah, companies yeah. always, uh, state-owned company always very big, right? And have much more money, right? To maybe if you want to be, make some, uh, to do some uh, IT projects, you have to enough funds maybe to, to support. Yeah, yeah. And then, but always the projects are many kinds of companies work together. So it's very difficult for the uh, smart cities. Yeah, there are yeah, too yeah. many areas. Yeah. So there are many kinds of specialized IT companies, especially mm -hmm. especially uh, private companies. So it's no problem. But now uh, it's a trend. There are some new companies invested by public companies in private companies together. Now mm -hmm. there are many new yeah. Yeah, new yeah. startups, maybe like <laughs> yes. So I, I've been working with Steve Chun with the supercomputers. He's going around China. I can. And he just explains to the local uh, uh, cities and the local uh, companies that would benefit from having a better data system, shared data. And then eventually they get on board and they fund it. And not top-down government funding, but then they have to get government approval anyway. right? But it, the whole idea is to build up enough mo momentum and a desire for the result because you can demonstrate there's a benefit. And then you can get all kinds of people on board. Uh, I would say there are a lot of programs, projects. They may not be labeled as smart cities, but actually mm -hmm. they are. Yeah. Not necessarily all the projects. They have to put the labels on that. I actually saw a company. Uh, they actually took a, those uh, 3D scanner, uh, depth camera. And they take care of every part of your building, your light bulb, your, your, your switches, your doorknobs. So they take pictures. Then they put it into a database. So I asked them, why do you do this? He says, well, so every technician that come in want to repair that door, they say, oh, this door lock is broken. Then what do you do to buy a new one? So where do I buy? What's the part number? Who is the manufacturer? What's the cost? He said, oh, well, pull out your camera, uh, mobile phone scan that, take a picture of that, send it to, your, uh, to the database. The database come back and say, OK, you order from this company. Here's the part number. Here's the cost. Mm -hmm. How many pieces? One. So I said, oh, that's a 
sounds yeah. like a smart city. Yeah. Oh, so I never thought about that. I mean, yeah, there are so yeah. many things like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, way back in the corner there. Uh, so since most of the smart cities are uh, in the true government uh, companies, uh, what's the current state of sharing data with private enterprises? And what's the future of that as well in China? Future of sharing data? Private enterprises. The smart city data. It's always a balancing act, right? <laughs> but you have to show the benefit. Ultimately, if there's public benefit, then people will eventually see why they should share it. But it, ha it doesn't happen just like that. Of course, the Chinese government has control of more data, like facial recognition and all that stuff. But actually, if we're not committing crimes, it's not bad. Right? <laughs> okay, but, but, but I, I can see, but on the other side, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah it's uh, not so good that all the data are controlled by government. Yeah, but, right. If government want to open the data to the society, it's much more easier. Because government, China, China government only just give an order to all the state of enterprises. Mm -hmm. All the data, I think, can be opened to more widely. It's much easier. Now there are some big uh, projects, mm -hmm. data sharing projects now are pushed directly by uh, Premier Li, Premier Li Keqiang, uh, he is pushing many big platforms to mm -hmm, let mm -hmm. all the data to share to the, yeah. to, to the society. Well, so it's, uh, yeah. on the other side, it's easy. It depends on what the leaders, or the China leaders are thinking about. So yeah. I think mm -hmm. it's, it's much easier. Yeah. So in my view, in future, AI now is, so this year the AI investment is uh, for startup is uh, much more than in United States startup this year. Mm -hmm. In 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 so uh, I think uh, AI uh, will so much tea in future in the next few years will, will grow very, will grow very fast. So mm -hmm. so bottom line, we go back to our original observation about smart city and big data, is that there's so much data. There's no way one organization or one person could control it. We need to have the data available and then manage how we could use it to improve situations. Right? And so making it public data or public organization data, then they can solve problems better if they have it. Right? But it has to be broken down. I mean, yeah. a lot of decisions have to be made within one second. right? You're going to try to give that to some official to make that decision? It doesn't make sense. I mean, if, like with PG&E's uh, fire, right? With They didn't even know where the pipe was broken. It took them a while to figure it out. So that that's not a good way to handle those things, right? You've got to have the data, make it available, turn the switch off, no more gas going, then the fire stops. <laughs> Okay, it looks like we run out of time. We need to, uh, we can continue the conversation outside and have something to eat as well. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.